everybody feeling this morning? Not too great, eh? I mean, hey, it's a rough weekend. Hey, I love that you're here, and if you're here for the first time uh, and we don't know each other, I'm Adam, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here, and man, love the time of singing this morning. If you remember nothing else, we are about the love, the strength, and the person of Jesus. He is our Lord, those who have placed their trust in him, and that is what we are about as a church. And as we start this series uh, that we're so excited about called My Church, I wanna start with a question, is how many of you, when you see the gas light come on in your car, this, this right here, you say, game on. Game on. How far can I get without running out of gas? Anybody with me that does that? You just consider it a challenge? A few people, okay? Some of you don't even see this because you are very detailed people and uh, the uh, people that, you know what, when it gets to a fourth of a tank, you fill back up. That's you. And then there's some of you in the room that you never even look at the dashboard because your spouse goes and takes care of filling up your tank and they are, uh, they are there to fill up your gas tank. There's, I mean, wherever you are on uh, that spectrum is, but I, get, I guarantee to you, how many, I mean, come on, I mean, just, hey, be honest, how many of you, no matter how young or old, I mean, young, definitely, you can't be 13 and driving a car, but if you are 16, no matter if you're 16 or you're 87, how many of you have actually ran out of gas before? All right, a pretty good bit. I feel better. I feel better. I have run out of gas two times in my life. One was actually when I was 16 years old, 16 years old, and the other was when I was 19 years old. Uh, one time when I was 19, I was out in the boonies uh, going to see my dad, and I just wasn't paying attention, and I ran out of gas. I had to walk like about a mile and a half to the gas station to buy a gas tank. I was freaking out, uh, and I filled my tank back up. But when I was 16 years old, never told anybody this before, by the way. My stepdad is going to like get mad at me because he watches, he and my mom watch every week. And there he's like, oh goodness. I mean, there's another story. But when I was 16 years old, uh, the gap, I mean, literally it was very much, it, this line was past the E in my car. Okay, I was 16 years old. I was always going everywhere. But I could see the E and the red line was over here and I was in trouble. And I just had this feeling I was going to run out of gas. So I actually was driving faster and I was driving around this curb and I actually just spin out. Uh, going because I was trying to get to a gas station. I had gone who knows how long and it was horrible. It was horrible because, again, a little bit of me, like some of you, is like, hey, game on. How far can I go? I didn't have any money, and my stepdad was probably tired of me asking for money all the time to fill up or anything in between. And so I ended up spinning out, scared the life out of me. But the reality is when you think about this, getting gas in your car, not having gas in the tank, it actually hurts the car. I'm not a car guy. I don't understand cars. I'm not a mechanical guy. But I know when you drive around without uh, any gas, it's going to mess up your fuel pump. It's going to mess up fuel injectors and probably a lot of other things. And the reality is that cars were not made to drive on empty. They were not made to drive on empty. And what we are here to talk about today is neither are we. As people, we are not made to run on empty. 
Some of us actually pour, pay more attention to our cars being filled up with gas than our own lives. And the reality is, what, what does it look like? What does it look like for us to fuel up? When we're on E, when it comes to this life, and so many people in the room, there's so many different situations to where our lives are led down a path to where we run on E a lot. What does it look like for us to fuel up? And again, most of us pay more attention to our literal cars, filling them up with gas, than we do our own souls, our own minds. Have you ever felt like you were running on empty before when it comes to this life? I mean, somebody says, yes, I know I have. Running on empty, this is what happens when we run on empty. We numb out. The people around us, we start checking out of the groups that we, uh, that we work with, we live with, our friends. We just numb out. We start isolating ourselves. We stop talking and we just numb out. We can't say no to things. Even if they lead to regret when we are on empty for whatever the reason, for whatever's going on in our lives, we end up not being able to say no to things. We become impulsive. We look, here's a good one, we look to others to give us meaning. That's not a good road. When we're on E, because we end up looking to whoever will give us meaning. We will do whatever they say because we're on E. They don't love us, but because we're on E, we just go down that path of looking to everyone else to give us meaning, even if it's down the wrong path. We do things that will lead to regret. And as you're walking in the room today, are you on empty? Are you on empty today? That's not how we are supposed to live. We're supposed to live lives of flourishing. We're supposed to live lives that are thriving. But so often we live lives on E and it leads us to all kinds of bad decisions, numbing out. Jesus, he told us the very reason he came Look at this verse. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And this is Jesus' words. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. We're supposed to live with full tanks. That's what, as we are, place our trust in Jesus, as we follow him, as we follow him, he is there to bring us fullness of life. And it doesn't mean that we're gonna go through things that are not hard, but again, he gives us strength. But even as followers of Jesus, even as followers of Jesus, we live lives on E, on empty. And we start, we start things that used to inspire us, they don't always inspire us anymore. Things that, Man, made us feel alive. We don't feel alive anymore. We lose passion. Even as followers of Jesus, we grow uninterested. But as we think about, think about the people that inspire you right now. Take just a quick moment. Who is someone that inspires you? As I think about the people that inspire me, and as I think about just being in places where I'm living life on E, and, but there's people that, you know what, they got hard things. As I see them live their lives, they got hard things going on, yet they still have confidence in God. Their faith still grows. Even as followers of Jesus, have you ever felt like your faith was on E? Again, going back to things don't inspire us anymore. We're just kind of coasting through life, trying to get through whatever it is that we're going through. And yet we see people that inspire us. Like how, what do they have that I don't? How is it that they're going through a horrible time? 
yet they still love other people. They still forgive other people, the people that mistreated them. Something in them has them to where they can forgive someone who hurt them. They maintain peace. They demonstrate joy even in the midst of what they're going through. What is that? It's not because they're just hoping along abstractly. They're just thinking, oh yeah, just peace is coming, Pete. I have peace. How did they get that? How did they get that confidence in God? How did they, how can they demonstrate joy in the midst of, it seems like if I was going through that, there's no way I could demonstrate joy. There's no way I could forgive that person who mistreated me. What do they have that I, that I don't? The ability to continue on one step forward in the midst of hard circumstances. That's what this series is all about. My church, how can we, what are the habits and practices that help us get to a place where we're on full, or even if we're feeling empty with life, somehow we have these reserves, because that's what those people that inspire you, that's what they have. It's like they have a reserve tank that they can still demonstrate joy. They can still have peace when, it's, when life is hard. And we're gonna look at some habits, some practices that will help us stay Help our tanks stay on full. Jesus, before the first century church started, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus gave a command, a commission to his followers before he ascended back into heaven. This is one of the last things he said to them. Then Jesus came to them. This is in Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's why we sing about the truth that he is our Lord. We do whatever he commands because of this statement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me because he conquered death through his power, through his strength. But then he tells us, therefore, because of that, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And this is what will happen. This is the promise. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is what the purpose of the local church is, to go and make disciples. The main purpose, followers of Jesus, he is our Lord. We follow him. We just don't believe in him. We follow him and we do whatever he commands because he is our Lord. This is what he told us to do. And there are some habits and practices. There are some habits and practices that we're going to look at over the next few weeks that help our tanks stay on full. We're building up reserves because here's the reality. We are going to go through hard things. Every single one of us, if you haven't already, if you're not currently going through it, you will go through hard things. And as followers of Jesus, and I realize there's some of you here that don't take on scripture, you don't do what it says, you don't know if you believe, but you're kind of hopeless in life, and that's why you're here today. The invitation is for you to give your life to Jesus But as we trust in him, followers of Jesus, there are commands and practices that we can do to help our tanks stay on full to where you won't hit empty. That's what's available to us. It's available to us that as you continue to come to be a part of the church, your identity is formed in Jesus, what he says about you, not what your friend says about you. Not what your parents say about you, what Jesus says about you. And you can find identity through a relationship with him. You can find belonging of being a part of his local church, his church. That what he said, the church was going to change the world and your purpose. You may be going at life where you feel no purpose at all. You can find purpose through trusting your life to Jesus. That's what the next few weeks are about. And so as we, today, as we start this series, we're gonna look 
at as we look at the New Testament documents. That's the, every document under the New Testament. If you're new to Bible, it's broken up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. Every single document, account of Jesus, letter that was written, it was written by a real person, written to re real people who were going through real problems, real challenges, that the same challenges we go to. Ever lost a loved one, anyone? They did too. Ever had conflict in your home? They did too. Ever been misunderstood? They did too. Ever felt financial pressure and maybe even led to financial problems? They did too. They, know, they knew what it was like to live, trying to do what Jesus commanded them to do, but living in a culture that was pulling them away from what Jesus commanded them to do. They understood. And as we look at this letter, it's called Hebrews. It was written to Jewish people. We don't actually know who the actual writer was. There's all kinds of different uh, scholars think different people wrote it. But they were writing to a group of followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. And what it says is it says, let us, let us hold, let us hold unswervingly tight to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. I love this word unswervingly. It's this tenacity. It's like, hey, grip it and hold it tight. It was a soldier's term. It was fight for this, fight for this as a warrior to get to a place many were feeling. They knew exactly what we go through today. Ever felt like hope was a million miles away when it comes to the situation that you're going through? They did too. That's why the writer wrote this, hold on to hope. Hold on to hope. Hold it tightly because Losing someone is going to happen. Losing someone when you don't expect it, that diagnosis that you didn't expect. Being left out of a group of friends. Feel like everyone's against you. Hey, your marriage is continuing to struggle. What the writer of Hebrews was hold on to hope. Ever, ever, had a deal gone, go bad in the workplace and you were left holding the bag? They understood this. Ever had a child not open up to you about what was going on in their lives and you're nervous about it? That's what the writer of Hebrews was saying. Hold on tight to the hope. And here's the reality. It's normal. Everything that we go through, that's normal. That was the point that the writer was saying is hold tight because these things are going to happen when you don't expect it. How did I get to this place? There's no hope in this situation. And I know it's hard to believe, especially for those of you who don't know what you believe about Jesus. It's hard. Like, what are you talking about? Holding on to hope that God is faithful. That's hard to believe. I understand that. That's what the writer was saying. It wasn't karma. It wasn't just go to the store and get a bunch of motivational posters saying, hey, just have hope. Just have peace. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't abstractly holding on to hope. There were, the writer was saying there is an object. There is an object to our hope that God can be trusted and he will fulfill his promises every single day time. That what God has done for you, he's trustworthy. He's good. He's faithful. You can count on it. That hope is the assurance. It's the assurance that what God declares about you is true. Not what culture, not what your friend, not what your parents. It's the assurance that what God declares about you is true. Even when you're feeling doubts, that's going to happen. When shame fills your mind, when your past, the struggles of the past, 
your current struggles, when they fill up your mind and rear their head, when they rear their head and they speak loudly into your mind that God doesn't love you, he can't be trusted, you're not loved by God, you're not forgiven, what are you talking about? When that voice comes up in a moment, the writer was saying, hold tight. Hold tight to the hope without wavering that what Christ has done on the cross, that he can bring strength to you in those moments. It is the final word. No matter what shame you're feeling, no matter what your past is, no matter what your present is, he can turn something good in that was bad. He can turn it into good that you are not forgotten. And as your heart and your mind fill up with doubt, the writer was saying, hold tight to the hope, the promise of God that he is near to you and that he is with you as you place your trust in him. The promises of God are more true, more true than any feelings that you have every single time. Our feelings will lead us in the wrong direction. As we're on E and we look to everyone else, as we look to social media, as we look to our boss, as we look to our parents, they could lead us in the wrong direction. And that is what the writer is saying. Hold tight. And we need constant reminders Constant reminders to push us towards that hope that God can be trusted and he will always do what he promises. That is our assurance. That's what faith is. The confidence and assurance of what we hope for. And it's the evidence of what we can't see. We can't always explain it. It's a mystery. But there's something about as we trust in Jesus and we go through hard things, he can give us strength to move one step ahead. And he's with us. He can give us joy in the midst of sorrow. We can demonstrate joy and peace even with going through a hard situation. We've got to put ourselves in environments that push us to that hope. The writer goes on in verse 24. Let us consider how we may spur, spur or another word for that is motivate. How we may spur or motivate one another on towards love and good deeds. You have people in your life that do that, that encourage you, that push you, that motivates you to who God made you to live out the fullness that he has, to not settle for small living. People that encourage us. As I think about this past week, our staff went to a conference and this, something happened that did this for me. I was kind of just overwhelmed with thoughts in my mind of just leading a church, leading a family, all our busy schedules with our family and just felt like I was on E. And in that moment, we was at a conference and we were just singing about God's faithfulness. And all of a sudden, a lady was sitting in front of us. And she was sitting, everybody was standing up and she was sitting down. And she was probably in her 70s. And all of a sudden, I'm just like overwhelmed with like just thoughts. And, and then I look down and I see this elderly woman lifting up her hands and singing as loud as she can. And in that moment, I was just filled up. I'm like, wow, that motivated me to get out of my own head and being pushed towards God's faithfulness because he's good. He's good. As I look back over my life, he's good and he's faithful. And it just, that situation, it Filled up my tank. I think about my small group. Monica and I's uh, our current small group. They push us. They encourage us. They check on us. Hey, how are you doing? 
As we think about prayer requests in our group, they follow up and they expand. Our faith is expanded a little bit more just by being in relationship and being in community with those couples. They motivate me. That's what the writer is talking about. If you want your tank to stay full, you have got to put yourself in consistent environments that push you and spur you towards love and good deeds and the hope that you hold as a follower of Jesus. You know where that happens? It happens here. It happens here in the local church. It's why some of you are here today is because you're, you're constantly being encouraged by this place. You're motivated by this place. When we are together, when we are together, and that's what the writer was saying, is you need to be in a consistent environment that's pushing you towards the hope that you have in Jesus, that he can be trusted, and he all, will always do what he promises. The writer goes on in verse 25. So again, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds and not giving up meeting together. Another word for meeting is assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. But encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. How many of you have people in your lives that inspire you as you meet with them, as you meet together, as you assemble together, are pushing you and motivating you and encouraging you towards the love of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. That their habits, their practices push you towards a better life. Pushes you and fills your tank up by just being with them. That's what the writer is talking about is something happens. Something happens when we gather on a weekly basis in the local church. That when you hear a story, you're like, that's my story. And it fills your tank up. Some of you are still thinking about Lindsay's story from Easter of her sharing what she went through and how God can be trusted. Some of you, as you hear a message, you're thinking, are they reading my mail? Because it seems like they're just talking to me. No, we're not reading your mail. No one's reading your mail. There's something that happens when we gather. Something happens that can't be replicated and can't be replaced. And you know what? Here's the answer. Jesus gave it to us. In Matthew 18, for where two or three gather in my name, where two or three gather, Gather in my name. There I am with them. That's what you're experiencing when you hear someone's story. When you see someone worshiping and it fills your tank up, you may not understand what they're doing. Like, why are they raising their hands? I heard someone say at one time, like, what's the deal with all the antennas? And it's funny, but when Jesus is your Lord and he's helped you, have strength in the midst of a hard circumstance. When he's walked with you through a circumstance that seems unbearable, it's a whole different story. You start seeing him like he can be trusted. He is faithful. That's what happens when we gather. And what Jesus is talking about is there something that happens when you experience him on a weekly basis? When we gather together, there's something that you can experience that you can't experience with him by yourself. I'm not downplaying personal time with God. It's vital. But there is also something that happens when we gather together. It goes beyond learning. You can learn something on a podcast. I listen to it over and over. It's beyond that. Is he's here with us as we gather and something happens in our hearts that pushes us and motivates us toward deeper love of Jesus and a deeper passion of following him. It is where 
the refill happens. You being in this place, that's why it's so important. It isn't to make ourselves feel good. It isn't to, hey, we just want to uh, fill the room. We do want to fill the room because of what we're talking about today. Not to make ourselves feel better. But there's something that happens when we gather the refill. When you're on E, the reserves that you think about, the people that, in, that go through hard circumstances that still can forgive, that still can love, that still can demonstrate joy, that's the reserves that you see. It's through being refilled by being together and being motivated towards a deeper love of Jesus and a deeper passion of following him. So the question today is, what is it going to take for you to prioritize gathering here? What's it going to take? Because culture today says that someone attends once every month to two months. And we're still living on E. Those hard situations are still going to happen. What is it going to take? It's going to take you pre-deciding. Pre-deciding what your feelings can't override. I'm going to repeat that. You pre-deciding what your feelings can't override. Because we can talk ourselves out of anything. Ah, had a long night. Traveled back in town. It takes you pre-deciding. It takes you pre-deciding, you know what? Are we going to go to church? Yes, we're going. Nothing's going to talk us out of it. And I'm not saying you can't go. On, I'm not saying don't go on vacation or whatever it is. But you got to see the reality of what takes place when we're here on a weekly basis. And as we close this message, it's not just pre-deciding that you're going to be here. You have to realize that you have something to bring every single one of you, every single one of you watching online, I'm not downplaying watching online, but there's something when we gather, you have something to bring. Your presence, it has purpose. Your presence being here on a weekly basis, it has purpose. How many of you are Lego people? Any Lego fans in the room? Especially, yeah. yeah, awesome. Hey, some of you hate Legos because when you step on them, a few choice words come out of your mouth. It's happened to me as well. <laughs> Love kids with Legos. Some of my favorite memories are with uh, my oldest son are putting Legos together. He loved putting Legos together as a kid. And reality with Legos, they all start the same way is you open the bag and you spread out the pieces, every single piece, individual pieces laid out together. They have to be assembled. Going back to the verse, let us not give up meeting or assembling together. When they're assembled, you create something great. Some of you OCD people are thinking like, hey, you don't have all the pieces on this Guardians of the Galaxy spaceship. I know, I know. But when they're assembled together, they create something unbelievable. And as we think about the first century followers that the writer of Hebrews was writing to, they were committed to this. They realized that they all had, were a piece being assembled together, being assembled to be a part of something bigger. When they're assembled, it creates something beautiful. And the reality is of this place is the local church is not complete without you bringing your peace. And what we have today is we have a lot of people who are attending, not assembling. Attending is spectating. Assembling is hands-on. A 
Attending is thinking about what can I get out of this event that I'm going to. Assembly, assembling is what am I going to bring to this living, breathing place to bring my purpose, the purpose of my peace, to push, to encourage, to motivate people towards Jesus. And the hope, the hope that the writer of Hebrews was talking about, hold tight to it. Attending is really saying it's all about you. Assembling is saying it's about someone else. And the reality of what we're here to do is we're here to assemble. That's what he was talking about. Don't give up assembling together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage, motivate, spur others towards the love of Jesus towards experiencing him, towards serving them. And as you think about your peace, if I was to take one of these off, every single one of you in the room is a peace that is there to assemble here. And it may be another church that you are assembled at, but here, as we think about calling this local church my church, the habit and practice of assembling is vitally important. You have to pre-decide because your feelings will talk you out of it. Your feelings will talk you out of it. You got to realize every single one of you, I don't care if you're 12, I don't care if you're 89, the local church, you have a peace to bring every single week. You have a piece to bring. You may, as, as you think about assembling, like, hey, I only have a small piece. I'm only just opening the door for people. I'm just standing in the parking lot. I'm just running a computer. I'm sitting down with preschoolers, pointing them and encouraging them to have an unbelievable view of their heavenly father. Everybody has a different role, but everybody has purpose in their peace. As you think about your identity, this is where you find your identity in Jesus of being a part of what is called in scripture, the body of Christ. We all have a purpose to bring each week. And that's why assembling is so important. That's why it's so important to not talk yourself out of it. Because again, you worshiping about God's faithfulness, you never know who is watching you. Like, hey, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why they're so excited about singing the song, but there's something that's going on inside of me as I watch this person worship their Lord. You may not know what a simple smile a simple hug will do for someone else. You don't know where they are. But again, that's an assembling mindset of you bringing your peace. Your belonging can be found here. Your purpose can be found here. And again, let's read the verse again. Let us consider how we may spur one another, motivate one another towards love and good deeds. And not giving up assembling together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. As we start this series called My Church, and that is our hope. I say this all the time. It is our hope that you make Wiregrass Church your church. And the first habit, the first practice that's going to build up reserves for you as you go through hard situations, whatever it is, 
as someone hurts you, as your marriage continues to struggle, as your child will not communicate with you and you're worried about it, as you're holding the bag of that bad deal, when you pre-decide to assemble together on a weekly basis, your faith is going to be so much stronger. Your life is going to be better. Your life will have identity, belonging, and purpose. And I want to show you, as we close, I want to show you a visual. Small visual, but the impact is unbelievable. As we imagine, imagine if these 150 people decided, pre-decided what their feelings would not override, that they were going to be here. Am I going to go to church today? Yes, I'm going. Mom, are we going to church today? Yes, we are going. Something beautiful will happen. When we assemble together, uh-oh, got to be careful as you're going to see this. When we assemble together, we create something beautiful. Now, I just want to thank our production director, Garrett Hughes, for trusting us with this Lego that he himself put together. But it is a beautiful picture. It is a beautiful picture of what will happen when we predecide that we have a peace. There's a purpose in us assembling together on a weekly basis. And it's a beautiful picture. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you will take this from our minds and sink it into our hearts. The fact that when we gather in your name, when we gather in your name, you are there. You are there with us. And that we have purpose in the peace that we bring to your body, to your local church, that we are there for a purpose. So I pray, God, that we all will be challenged. We will be encouraged to predecide, to predecide what our feelings talk us out of so many times, and that is gathering and assembling in your name. Let us hold on to that hope that you are faithful and that you can be trusted. Help us not to forget that, no matter how hard circumstances get in our lives. God, we love you and thank you for demonstrating your love for us. God, you forgive us. God, you bring life to us. We love you and it's in your name we pray. Amen.